Hi, I'm Gabrielle, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 214. Ever feel like you're sharing a message, but it's just not sticking? Like you're talking, but no one is really listening. Well, today we are diving deep into the power of storytelling with a true expert who's been helping leaders communicate more effectively for over 20 years. Get ready to discover how to craft compelling narratives that not only inform, but also inspire. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Surf's Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's needed to design great services that resonate with people, push our businesses forward, and of course, honor our planet. Our guest today, Gabriel Dolan, is a communication expert who believes that stories are the most powerful way to connect with people and drive change. She's worked with countless leaders to help them find their voice and share their message in a way that truly resonates. But what's really interesting is how she got here. After a successful career in the corporate world, she took a leap of faith and decided to follow her passion for storytelling. And let me tell you, she hasn't looked back since. She's even written seven books, which is pretty impressive considering that she told me she failed her final year of English, though we're just 1% short. Get ready for a conversation that's both informative and inspiring as we explore how to craft narratives that not only engage, but also move people to action. In today's conversation, you are going to learn about the key elements of a good story. We'll explore how to bring more stories into your work, even if you don't see yourself as a natural storyteller. Gabriel will share how a simple spreadsheet can actually help you tell better stories. We'll discuss the difference between a story and a good story. And she'll explain why you should never start a story by saying, let me tell you a story. Plus, we'll uncover how to use stories to drive change and make real impact. I was really struck by Gabriel's belief that storytelling isn't just some magical superpower only a few gifted people have. She believes that it's a skill that can be learned and honed with practice. And as you'll hear, she shares some really practical advice on how we can all become better storytellers. Whether you are looking to connect with your colleagues, inspire your team, or simply share your ideas in a more engaging way, this conversation is packed with actionable takeaways. All right, enough from me. Let's hear from Gabrielle herself. I'm really excited for you to hear this conversation and I'll be back with some final thoughts at the very end. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Gabriel, you mentioned that your time in corporate uh, Australia sparked your interest in storytelling. Can you take us back to the moment where you sort of first hand experienced the power of stories? Yeah, look, it was probably over a couple of years, but it was going back about 22, 23 years ago. I was in senior leadership roles at um, National Australia Bank, which is one of Australia's largest banks. And I was also in some senior change management roles. And what I started to notice is that when I was, you know, going out to business units and communicating the change through stories, it seemed to get the message across better. And it, look, it wasn't this magical silver bullet but it seemed to be um, a better way to explain the change and people would sort of go, yeah, I, I can sort of see why it makes sense. And so I had this concept that storytelling is a better way to communicate in business. I looked, I actually looked around and thought, you know, there's, there's got to be something in this. And I came across a book from Steve Denning and it was called, um, Oh, God, I've forgotten. Storytelling in Organisations, I think it was called. And he had written this book. Steve Denny was a ex-senior uh, exec at the World Bank. And when I read the book, I thought, you know, if, an, if a senior exec 
at the World Bank can write a book on storytelling, it sort of gave me the confidence to go, this is this is genuine, this is legitimate, it's, it's really professional. And so um, I, I was sort of, that was flying around in my head for a couple of years. I started to notice that the really good leaders shared stories, that the brilliant presenters shared stories, and it was um, almost 20 years ago, in fact, it was in January 20. 25 January next year will be 20 years ago that I left the corporate world and decided that I could be the one that could teach people how to tell stories more effectively. So um, that's that's where it took me. So I, I left corporate and uh, started teaching people storytelling 20 years ago. So you have been doing this for two decades right now mm -hmm. and you mentioned to me that you hope that after our conversation, we will be maybe more inspired to use more stories in mm -hmm. our communication. Um, could you share with us what makes you believe that stories can be more effective ways of communicating compared to other ways of communicating? Well, first of all, I know firsthand from my experience in sharing stories, but what I've, I guess because I've been doing this for 20 years and and Mark, if you go back 20 years ago, storytelling wasn't seen as a legitimate skill in business. Like people were going, what has storytelling got to do with business? So that was 20 years ago and it's progressively changed. And I've, I, you know, I've probably spent the first part of that 20 years educating the market on why it happened. But now it's seen as an absolute key leadership skill, an absolute key communication skill. And I've had, you know, I've, I guess I've trained tens of thousands of people and the amount of people that come back to me and say, you know, I did your storytelling course five years ago or eight years ago and 10 years ago and literally say it changed the way they communicated for the better forever. Um, I've had some people say it was it made them a better leader and so I know that the skills that I give them helps them and, and you know, all the research will show that when you share a story, it actually helps your message stick. Like people remember stories. They don't remember facts and figures and statistics and anything like that. So I fundamentally believe that stories make your message sticky. That's interesting. Uh, let's dive into this a little bit deeper because um, I still feel that stories aren't that accepted in the corporate environment as uh, you maybe suggested a minute ago. How do you... like? How do how do you approach corporate environments that are still dominated by uh, quote unquote hard facts, numbers, yeah. statistics? Like, do you encounter skepticism, and if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I I don't encounter as much skepticism now than I did twenty years ago. Like, there was a lot of skepticism. Um, how I deal with it is I give examples of stories, and then you know I say. You know, did that help you understand the message better? And they go, yes, it did. And it was like, you know, would you remember it? So, do, would, do you want, let me give you an example. And then, Please because do. I yeah. do, share because a story. I actually, <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll share a story which will help you show the power of storytelling. So, the example I often give when people are sort of going, yeah, but you know, we're we're all about facts and figures, and I, like, it's not. I'm not saying you don't need facts and figures. You absolutely do. But I, I give this as an example. So, I worked with a a client and it was the risk team. So it was the entire risk team. And the head of risk, her name was Rosemary. And Rosemary sort of said that one of the biggest challenges that she has is when she's trying to communicate the role of the risk manager and the role they play in risk. She goes, I just, I just don't get the message across. She goes, every time risk comes up, they look at me and go, you're the risk manager, that's your job. And she said, it, it doesn't matter how many times I've told them I cannot manage their risk for them, the message doesn't get through. She goes, you know, I've given case study after case study, example after example of the benefits of managing your own risk, the consequences of not. But she said, just the, it doesn't work. And she goes, I've tried everything. And she tried everything except a story. So she was trying to communicate through facts and data and logic. So this is the story that she shares. And she said, 
When I was a kid, I grew up at a farm and growing up on a farm, there was all these dangers we needed to be aware of, but mum would teach us what to do. So we knew what to do when we came across redback spiders in the timber heap. We knew about all the potential traps in the dam after heavy rain, and we knew what to do if we ever came across a snake in summer. And I remember this hot day, mum was, you know, telling me to get my bike from the front gate that I'd left at the gate. So I ran down to get my bike and then I just froze because in front of my bike was this massive copperhead snake. But I remembered everything mum taught us to do. So I played statues and I slowly walked backwards until there was enough space between me and the snake and I ran back to the house to tell mum. And I'm sharing this with you because it reminds me of the role we play in risk. All I can do is give you the skills, knowledge and advice so when you come across your own copperhead snake, regardless of what that looks like, you will know what to do. So... Mark, I share this story and then I ask them three questions and and I'll ask you, right? Does that story help you understand the role of a risk manager better and the role you play in risk? Does it actually help you understand the message better? I would say so. It's hard to judge that because I I would also have to see the facts and figures story, but yes, it resonates with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it helps you understand the message better. The do you think you remember that story? So this is the other question I asked. Do you think you'll remember it? Yeah, for sure, because you're using metaphors and like things we experience in real life. So yeah, that absolutely is is easier to remember. Yeah, yeah. So it it, so it it helps you understand the message. Yes, yes, you still need the facts and figures, and that still needs to make sense. But the story helps you understand the message. You're gonna remember it. And then the final question I ask is if you had to. Could you read tell it to other people without mm. losing its meaning? And mm. and the and the answer is yes, you could. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have to do it word for word. So I come back to the fundamental challenges that you have when you're trying to communicate, whether it's you know your business values or your strategy or just a message, is do people understand it? Really understand it? Remember it when the meeting's over? When the presentation's finished? Um, and can they actually retell it? And a story will give you traction on those three things where facts and figures, you still need them. It still needs to make sense, but facts and figures aren't sticky. They don't make your message sticky. I, um, uh, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to New York with my daughter and we went to the 9-11 Memorial Museum and we went on a tour. So it was like a tour and you, and like anything, you hear lots of facts and stats and numbers about stuff, which are all very interesting at the time. And you also hear stories. When we were leaving the museum, my daughter Jess said to me, Mum, how tall did the guy say that column was? And I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember one fact, one stat. Like I said, even though they were interesting at the time, I couldn't remember them. The stories I heard, I will remember for the rest of my life. If that's the case, and I'm, and we, everybody listening here, most likely is uh, on your side here. Why do so many organizations still underutilize the power of stories and uh, seek, I don't know, evidence, proof in uh, very quantifiable and measurable arguments? The, the reason we do it is we think we think uh, facts and data is is professional that that's the way we should communicate. We just, you know, stick to the, you just give me the facts. No one's ever said, give me the story. So we think it's credible. We think like people go, well, you can't argue with facts. It was like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really? Is anyone following the US presidential election? You can spend (laughs) your life. So you literally can spend your life arguing against facts. So, um, and I've had, you know, so people think it's professional. The other thing, Mark, and I think this is the most important thing is, um, they don't know how to do it. So they actually don't know how to tell a story properly. And if you don't know, if you don't have the capability, you therefore don't have the confidence. So when I train leaders, and again, why I love what I do, I will often have senior leaders say to me, it never even occurred to me to share a story, like share a personal story to get that message across. So it's almost I'm giving them permission to say, this is absolutely credible. And then I give them the capability, which then gives them the confidence. So, um, yeah, let's get into the capability uh, element in a moment. I first want to address the first point you mentioned about uh, it doesn't feel professional. Like, 
that's a huge challenge because that's a cultural element. Yeah. Which, yeah. like, how do you, how do we can have the skills to tell a story, but if it's if we don't feel that it's accepted or we feel that we might lose credibility or face or status, which is a huge thing. Like, what's your way around that? How do you, how do we deal with that? Yeah, look, and that can happen. Predominantly I deal with that because I normally, when I go in and train leaders, I'm starting at the top. So I'm starting at the senior executive team and then it's almost we go down to the next level. If um, if you sort of go in the middle and and it is a culture where you don't share stories, people will still be reluctant to do it, especially if they don't see their senior executives doing it. So if they they could go, yeah, look, I get it, makes sense, but no one else around me is doing it and I'm not I'm not going to take that risk and they see it as risky. But, you know, the reality is if we just stick to communicating in a very reporting, boring way, then our message isn't getting through. And, and and I also do say sometimes all you do need is the facts and the figures and the, st- you know, if you're doing a project status update, for example, you are just reporting on information and it's just, you know, this is where we're at, this is the number and that a lot of the time all you need to do is that. But if you want to get people to think, feel or do something different, if you want them to actually understand and remember that's when you need a story. So stories move from instead of just reporting on information, which is a lot of time you have to do, stories are used to create a connection and influence and inspire an outcome. I think everybody, again, listening to your story here will resonate with this because our work is about delivering change. Everything we do has to do with change. We're changing attitudes, changing processes, changing minds. And that's um, facts and figures, even though we are told that that's the way to go. Uh, can you make a business case? Can you prove it? Um, yep. Listening to you, that's not the way to go. That's not how you no. will inspire and influence people to move yep. in a direction. Yeah. And that's and again, as a leader, that's sort of what you're doing. You're trying to get either people to do something different, like influence them to do something different feel something different, actually feel connected to you or your company or the strategy and think something different to go, oh, yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about it that way. And a story will do that where facts and figures will not because I can just argue. And I, I and I think, um, you know, I've been involved in change, managing change for probably 30 plus years now. And I would say that the vast reason why change fails or doesn't get the traction we want is we're trying to communicate everything through logic and all logic does is inform people. It certainly doesn't inspire people. Now it should make logical sense. Like it's kind of, I I had one guy once go, but you you know, we're a company that makes decisions based on logic and data. Oh, I, Mm -hmm. well, I would hope so. Like like, surely everyone does that. So it's almost like that should be a given that this makes logical sense, but you know, and you can still provide the logical reasons why, but the story will actually make that sticky and get people connected and engaged in it. Let's assume that we are convinced that stories are the way to go and we are sort of ready and courageous enough to embrace them and put them um, to work in our benefit and everybody we're serving. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into some... um, practical skills. You mentioned that storytelling is learnable. We can get better at it. Can you share some practical tips, examples uh, that will get us moving in the right direction here? I think that the main, before you even get to storytelling, is you've got to be really clear on the message, be crystal clear on what you're trying to communicate. So the vast amount of the work I do is helping people communicate values. So if you look at Um, you know, you can communicate this for strategy or for change or for the company purpose or company values or your leadership values. But when you look at something like values, like, you know, our value is integrity or collaboration or whatever, you can't communicate integrity through logic. Like you literally can't communicate values through logic. Um, So it's, it's where a story can happen. So I take people through this process on saying, well, what does that be really clear on the message? So for, say, for example, you do want to communicate something like integrity or innovation or collaboration. The first thing I do is go, well, what does that mean to you personally? So what does integrity mean to you personally? 
And, Mark, you'd be surprised. I work with senior leaders and these are the company values and they will go, um, gee, I don't know. Gee, you've put me on the spot here. I haven't really thought about it this much before. So, you know, that fundamentally people aren't clear on the message. So I, I start with that. And then I help them find a story and my focus is on a personal story as in a non-work related story attached to a work message so just like rosemary shared the story about the copperhead snake so something that didn't happen at work but has used it and linked it to around risk management so some really basic things around storytelling is they've got to be true they absolutely have to be true so you've got to and people go what about if you embellish you don't need to embellish because your day-to-day stories are the most um, relatable. So just be true. Um, I'll, go, I'll give you a couple of things. Never start your story with let me tell you a story. So you know when people go, let me tell you a story. It's like, oh, please don't uh, because we conjure up all these images. So my What's a better way is- to start? Yeah. Start with time and place. So literally, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up on a farm. It's time and place. It should be one sentence. Um, you know, this morning at gym, it's one sentence. You know, on the weekend, I was going for a walk in the park. And you, so it's one sentence, but it's time and place. That actually makes it really conversational as well. And it can make it be an easy way to start. Um, your story should be succinct. So my advice in business is your story should be about 60 to 90 seconds long. So if you're going over two minutes, you're running the real risk of people um, thinking, get to the point. And the moment anyone starts thinking, get to the point, you're losing them. And uh, if you've ever had the, uh, if anyone has ever said to you, get to the point, I can guarantee you they've been thinking it for a lot longer than mm. what they've said it. So you've got to be really succinct. Um the other one is name your characters. So when you introduce people, you name them. So if I was talking about my two daughters, I'd go my daughter Alex, my daughter Jess, my husband Steve. Um, the only exception to that is if your story is about your parents or your grandparents, you would just go my mum. Like if I was talking about a story about my dad, I would just go my dad. I wouldn't mention his name to you because it, it's just dad. Um, and then the other thing is really linking it the way you end it is quite complicated, but you want to end it in a way that guides people to the to this um, message, but not telling them. So you do not want to end with, you know, the moral of the story is. Mm. So you, you, it's it's um, there's quite a skill involved, and and that's and that's why I'm saying it's an absolute skill, and there's an absolute skill taking a non-work related story and attaching it to your work message. Thank you. There's uh, already a lot of practical advice here. One of the things I would love to zoom deeper uh, on in is the work-related challenges. We sort of know what they are. And then you mentioned, Mm -hmm. okay, we need to find a personal story that connects to that. Where do we get, like... uh, how do we find those stories? I can imagine that that's a really challenging part for a lot of people. Yeah, it is because and it's challenging because they think the stories have to be these big, you know, climbing Mount Everest type stories. One of the things I get people to do in my workshop is like think of your earliest memory. So just think of an earliest memory and write it down and go, what was that about? Like was that about being supported? Was it about not being supported? Was it about... Um, taking a risk? Was it about just being stupid? <laughs> Whatever it was. And a lot of people go, well, it wasn't about anything. It was just this little thing I did. I go, no, it's a potential story. And then if you go through, um, you know, if you go through the rest of your life and think of everything, every memory. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but you will think of things and then you just go, what was that about? Like, and what you're doing is you're building up a list of potential stories you could use. So, you know, stories that you, like, I am um, on the weekend, I caught up with some friend of mine was over from Ireland and there were six girlfriends from school and we were, you know, all caught up and, and we were reminiscing about things that happened, you know, in school and all these stories. And straight away I go, oh, I could use that. I could use that story. I could use that story. And it's a case of going, how could, this happen and and what you could, um, what message you could do. So it's it's been on the lookout for stories. Once you know these little little stories can be so powerful, it's then going okay. That I'm going to use that story for this. Do you keep a list of your personal stories? 
I do. I do. What, I keep what, do you, so, what do you write down? Like, what are the elements that you capture? Yeah. So one of the things I talk, so I actually, um, I love storytelling and uh, I actually, this and this surprises people, I actually love spreadsheets. So I love a good spreadsheet. So, but if you, th- if you think of it almost as four columns, and so the first column is the high level concept. So for example, that could be like um, integrity. I want to communicate integrity or I want to communicate innovation. The next column is when you get into the habit of going, well, what does that really mean to me? What does it really mean to me? What, and you, you break it down. I, I always try to ask myself three, three times what that means. Mm-hmm. And then the, the third column are the personal stories. So these are, you know, so you could have Copperhead Snake. You just call it Copperhead Snake. And then the final column is the work stories. And, they, mm-hmm. and these are your work-related ones. But, I look, I know some people that just record it in their notes in their phone. Some people just have a notebook. Um, but you've got to get into the habit of when things happen, just go, I could use that story. So I'll, I'll give I'll give you another example. And um, so this happened a couple of years ago and my daughter, Alex, got me into wine drops. Now, I don't know if you know wine drops, but they come in a tiny little bottle and the idea is you put five drops in your bottle of wine and it's, it's meant to reduce the effect that preservatives have on you the next day, right? So I remember this day distinctly. It was a Friday night. It was like a like I'd had a really busy week and I opened up my bottle of Shiraz and I put the the five drops in and I poured myself a glass and Alex a glass. And then Alex went to refill our glasses and she's standing in the kitchen holding up the little bottle of, of drops and says, Mum, you didn't put this in the wine, did you? And I went, Yes, why not? And she goes, These are not wine drops, they're eye drops. She goes, you have poisoned us, right? And so she's going on saying we poison her. So my, you know, I, I think about that. That's a funny little story. And my first reaction was, well, you know, who who left it? Who left the eye drops in the kitchen? That's my first reaction. Blame someone else. My second reaction was, well, at least I didn't put wine drops in your eye because that could have been a problem. But my third reaction is, how could I use that story? Like, what do I make of that story? And so I think about it for a while and go, that is a great story around assumptions. Like if I wanted to communicate the dangers of assumptions, I could use that story. And so um, because I made the assumption so strongly, I didn't even read the label. M- mind you, Mark, if I had read the label, on the eye drops it said blink relief in every blink. And I think on a Friday night I just would have read that as drink relief in every drink. But what I can do then is I can just go, okay, um, wine drops, assumptions. So I'm, I'm creating a list of potential stories I could use and then the message I could use it for. You're sharing stories left and right. So this is your second nature. This is, um, it, it comes very uh, easy for you. At least you make it seem yep. like that. It, again, it's second nature. Now let's imagine that we're just starting out on our story journey. Mm-hmm. How do we, you, you mentioned the word permission. How do we find permission to actually start using them? Because I can imagine that when, when okay, we've listened to, to this podcast yep. and you're like, yeah, I'm going to use stories. And then the next business meeting, you're like, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring in a story. And it feels so uncomfortable, so awkward. Like, And then you either freeze or you don't do it at all. You, you uh, fall back to your old habits. Like, is there anything we can do to sort of give ourselves permission, lower that threshold, step into this cold ice bath? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And 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 sometimes it can feel like stepping into an ice cold bath. I so I'm telling these stories, and they seem what you said. They just seem like they came naturally to you, and it's so easy. What I have done with every story I have shared with you, I've thought about it. I've thought about what's the message, and is this the right story? So I've found the right story. I've written the stories out, so I've scripted them out, and I've practiced, 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 practiced to the point I don't need the scripts. You shouldn't. How do you need practice? What do you do to practice? Say it out loud. Literally say it out loud. So you know, like anything, you just, and you just say it several times in your head, and then throw the script away, and it, and it comes out naturally. You could also. Um, you know, you say you want to, you say you've got a business meeting and you, okay, you've come up with a story, you've written it out, you've practiced it. You could sort of run it by someone else and it, it could just be your partner or someone at work go, hey, I'm thinking of sharing this story. And so practice it that way. But you have to practice your stories. I, 
you see people that go, oh, they're just naturally good at it. They're not naturally good at it. I mean, you know, we're all natural storytellers, but the reason they seem so natural and so easy is because they've put a lot of time into it, they've prepared for it, and they've practised it. And this is a skill. And like any other skill, the more time and effort you put into preparing and practice, the better you'll be. But um, So that's a way, but Mark, make no mistake, when it, when it comes to it, you'll probably still feel awkward. It'll probably still feel like... What uh, makes it feel awkward? What's the thing that makes it feel awkward? Well, one of the things that makes it feel awkward is no one else is doing it. So especially if you're in an organisation where you go... Uh, you know, I've some people go, I've literally never short shared a personal story to get a work message across before. So there, there still is this, oh, is it professional? Will people judge me? Um, some, some leaders go, what if my team notice I'm doing something different? And I go, well, they probably will, but they will probably get, they'll probably go, thank you for taking the time and effort to making your communications better. So it will feel a little bit awkward and because it's following a new process. Um, but I, um, me and my husband recently took up golf after about 20 years. We hadn't played for 20 years with kids and stuff. And uh, one of the first things we did was go get a golf lesson. And, of course, the first thing they did to me was said, your your grip is completely all over the place. So I had to change my grip. And then for the next few times, you know, next, it felt really awkward it felt really, really awkward because you were focusing on it. Now, the danger is you go, no, nah, stuff it. I'm going to go back to the way it was. But if you keep at it, then it doesn't feel awkward any longer. This is fascinating. Um, your example with the golf lessons is you have somebody next to you who's giving you instructions and who's sort of pointing you in the right direction. And it feels awkward, but they are sort of encouraging you from the sidelines mm -hmm. to keep on going. Now, we want to get into storytelling. How do we, how do we, one, how do we know that we are making progress? Uh, so if we, if you're uh, practicing your swing, you sort of see whether or not the ball is landing at the spot that you want it to land, right? Yeah. How do we, what's the equivalent when we're practicing our stories? How do we know we are making progress? Yeah, yeah. We could, we could, we could really run with this golf analogy because it's Let's a similar go. things, right? You learn a skill. So I've learned a skill with a coach. He's taught me. Um, but in the end, I've got to go out and play. I've, I've got to go and do it. And um, so, and it's like sometimes it will work and sometimes it will not work. <laughs> and, that, and that's the reality as well. Um, so what I do with storytelling, to bring it back to storytelling, get out there and give it a go. So you've learned a new technique, give it a go. Then go, then almost assess did that work. Now, you will know if it works or not. Because people oh. will, so, well, they'll normally, you normally see them engaged. So you actually see people engaged. So that's, you know, our brains are, our brains are hardwired to listen to stories and we actually listen to stories differently. So you see people engaged. You, you might actually have people say that was a good story. Oh, oh yeah, that, that gets my message across. It made the point. So you actually say that. Um, Ro Rosemary, for example, when she shared her story about the copperhead snake, she noticed that her the team she shared it with during meetings would say, so have we identified all our copperhead snakes? So they were using copperhead snakes as the metaphor for risks. Now, that's a that's a great indication that your story's worked. So you, you, you may not know, but you should get those indications that stories worked. If If, on the other hand, if they come back and go, so how is that related to that? What, what, I don't get what you're saying. Then you go, okay, well, that story didn't work. But what I would say is in just like the golf swing, you go, okay, that shot didn't work and go, why didn't it work? And you go, right, because I wasn't holding the grip properly or I, you know, what, and go, right, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up. I'm not, I'm not going to go back to exactly what I was because I had one bad shot. I'm going to go, why did that, you know, why did I go off, you know, why did I shank that? And then go, okay, I'm, next time I go, I'm going to try it again. Are there uh, any other indicators of success? So you mentioned the fact that when people start repeating your story, that's a win because it's memorable yep. and apparently it's appealing to them. Are there any other indicators of success that your story is working? 
Um, well, sometimes it's the outcome. So do you actually get the outcome you want? So if you want them to, if you're trying to influence an outcome, do they actually do it? So it's it's getting them to think, feel, or do something different. So that that works. Um, but it's it's either people acknowledging, like literally they might go, oh, yeah, that's a good story, or or they refer back to the story. So they're the they're the the three indicators, I think. They're they're nodding along, they're referring to, they've actually said it's a good story, or they're referring back to the story. Or the fourth one is you've actually achieved what you want with it. The the challenging uh, aspect with that last part, the outcomes sometimes are either um they aren't immediate right yeah they and could be long term they could they, be long they term could, absolutely yeah and then it's hard to sort of um find a, a causal effect that it was your story or that your story contributed to yeah. it like again with yeah. your golf swing you see where the ball lands like there's immediate feedback and um as you mentioned immediate f- feedback could be people nodding or agreeing with you or sort of repeating your story the, do you also suggest that people at the end of their story do a check-in like did this make sense although i'm i'm quoting sense because it's not about the logic but about the feel do you suggest people yeah. do something like that um no i don't really suggest doing something like that but like i mark what you're talking about there too is when we communicate so like you you might have a team meeting and you're communicating this message you you don't know if that's worked either like we, you, you walk away, don't you? Don't know if that work. And I think when you sort of go, does that make sense? Whether you've whether you've shared a story or not, does that make sense? Most most people just say yes. Yeah, and exactly. it doesn't. Yeah, so, it doesn't give you the um, information. Yeah. Yeah, and and the point is too, it's not storytelling. Just one of your things. So I'm not saying don't share data, don't do case studies, don't do work examples. You've, you of course you want to do all that, but a story can really help with that. So. I often think of think of your story and all your data and logic as Batman and Robin, and you need both. Mm-hmm. And at the at the moment, we're just like just having story, story, story is not going to work. Mm. But at the moment, all we're doing is data, 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 and what and getting really frustrated why our messages aren't getting through. Are there any other situations where you've seen stories backfire? So you mentioned when it's become. When your story never ends and it keeps on going, that people will be like, get to the point, or the fact that it's just stories. Like, are there moments where it potentially can backfire? Yeah, it it ha- it can, and um, normally it backfires when people are coming from it with the wrong intent. So they're literally, and because storytelling, you know, is popular, people go, "Oh, you should share stories, should be vulnerable," and they're literally doing it to be vulnerable, and it, like people can see Have through you seen that. Examples? I, what I ha- I read an article um, a while ago, and I-, I forget who it was, and I clearly don't rate this person because they said there's four types of stories that leaders need, and one of the stories was the tearjerker. And I'm thinking, if you are coming from a place that the only reason I want to share this story is to get people to cry, then you are coming from a place of manipulation. Mm. And you know, you can come from a place of inf- influence, that's fine, but manipulation, I, that, I think that's a terrible place to come from. I think also um, when I've seen examples, and this hasn't come from a place of manipulation, but people have shared stories that are too personal and they're too raw. So one of the things, you know, th- this isn't about sharing, oversharing deep personal stories. And sometimes I, I talk about heal before you reveal. So share stories of scars, not wounds. And what I mean by that is you could be sharing something that's, uh, you know, was quite traumatic in your life, but it happened 20 years ago and you've recovered from it and you're Mm -hmm. comfortable sharing. But if it happened like a month ago and you start sharing it, you you could end just up in a, you know, a, you know, crying mess on the floor and it's not going to work. So your story, people are just going to feel really sorry for you. Um, but it's not going to be an effective story and people are going to feel uncomfortable. So it's finding the right level of emotion in your story. um, That's when it can really work. How do you gauge that, whether or not you have found the right level of emotion? Yeah, um, I think you've got to be comfortable telling it. 
So, um, and I'm not saying remove all emotion. Like some people share stories and when you retell a story, you don't just retell it, you relive it. And they, they do get emotional, but they sort of tear up or whatever. And that that's completely fine as well. But if you're a blubbering mess, then that's not going to work. So you've got to be comfortable. I think ultimately as a storyteller, you've got to be comfortable with sharing it. But what I find is... Um, the vast majority of people don't show enough emotion as opposed to showing too much emotion. And, and again, what I mean by emotion is they will share a story and they will just go through, um, you know, this happened, then this happened, then that happened, where what I want is what I want to get to them. And after they share a story, I'll say things like, so when that happened, how did you feel? Mm-hmm. And they go, oh, my God, I felt so you know, whatever, I felt so sick in the stomach or I felt so excited, like I, I just felt so excited. And I was like, can you put that in the story? So just talking about how you feel about things can actually make your stories a lot more personal. Yeah, that's the thing I think people will need to experience firsthand yeah. what it does to actually add that level of experience, especially, again, if you are in a corporate environment where like feelings aren't yeah. the thing that drives the existing narrative. Yep. Like what do yep. like feelings? Like we're 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 an assembly line, we're a factory, we're about the facts. Yeah. Like feelings just distract us from doing the actual work. But the reality is that we're not in a factory assembly line, right? The type of work no. has changed. Yep. Yeah. And the and the fact is we're human. And every human still, brain yeah. processes emotion <laughs> and yeah, still. And our brains processes emotion and logic differently and it processes emotion first before logic and it stores it in the long-term part of our brain. And so, you know, there's there's still some very old school people that will be going, oh, feeling it's, you know, works, works, personal, personal, don't mix the two, stop taking things so personally. It's We're human and our, and, and we do. And, and what I'm saying about feelings, like you could even share a work, a, like a work case study, a story, mm-hmm. even adding something like, I was actually really proud we were able to deliver on that. Like that's that's feeling, that's showing something. And, and you know, as long as it's genuine and true or, you know, you could be sharing something about a customer and saying, you know, I was actually devastated that we weren't able to deliver on that. And, again, so it's just even saying like one sentence on how you felt when something happened can take your stories to a can, – can take your work stories and almost make them personal. If there's still somebody listening to our conversation here and they are uh, still on the fence saying, you know what, Um, I'm not, I'm just not a natural storyteller. This isn't, this just isn't going to fly for me. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Uh, What I say to people when they go, look, I just don't think storytelling, you know, works for me or I can't do it. And I would go, okay, I go, you know what, if you are comfortable that what the way you're communicating now is highly effective and everyone's understanding what you're saying and remembering and you're inspiring them, you probably don't need to worry about it. And then they go, well, no, that I'm not saying that. That's not the case. Um, but what I would say is as human beings, we are all natural storytellers. So we are our natural storytellers. Some are better than the others, just like, you know, if we go back to the golf analogy or whatever, some people are naturally better at golf than others. But what I can tell you is if you learn how to do it properly, if you get coached, if you do training and then practice and practice and practice, you will get better at it. Just just like any other skill, any other skill, you will get better at it. So um, I would say start to explore it, like look in, you know, there's lots of books about it. I, I mean, I've written heaps of books, but there's other people who have written books. There's training workshops on it. Again, I run training workshops, but I'm not the only person that does. So explore what's out there but don't forget that this is a skill and like any other skill it can be taught and learnt and the more time and effort you put into it you will get better at it thank you for sharing so many practical tips i encourage everybody to sort of maybe rewind and listen back to the last 20 uh 25 minutes and make make some notes here i'm curious to also um pick your brain about um, the experience that you've had over the last two decades. Do you feel that your approach towards storytelling and your thinking about storytelling has evolved? And if so, how? 
Yeah, look, it, it, ha- it has and hasn't. Uh, it, well, it definitely has. Um, I think I've just got more experience. The, the, the framework I came up with and developed, I pretty much came up with when I left 20 years ago, and I have tweaked it sw- slightly, but 90% of that framework is pretty much the same. And I remember I... Um, I had a client ring me a couple of years ago and she said, oh, I did your training workshop like years and years and years ago. And when she told me, it was the very first workshop I'd ever done, like the very first storytelling workshop I'd ever run. And she did it. And she said, I just still remember how amazing it was. And that I I must admit, Mark, that did surprise me because I thought surely it wasn't that great. But um, so I... I've, I think I've got a lot better at teaching it. I know what works. I know I've known how to streamline the process. Um, but yeah, and it's just, and I, the more you do it, the more examples I can bring out. So, you know, I'm dealing with a, a client and they'll go, we've got this problem. And I go, yep. And I could just go bang, bang, bang with a whole heap of different stories that that um, gives them ideas for their own story. We've looked back uh, at the evolution and concluded that that stayed the same. Let's also look ahead maybe a little bit. And um, we have to address the uh, tech, uh, um, the tech, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uprise of AI. Like, yep. how do you look at storytelling uh, in the next few years? Like, do you feel AI will have an influence on that? And if so, how? Yeah, so it absolutely will. I mean, I think AI is going to have an influence on everything. Uh, I think with the rise of AI that the need to communicate in a more authentic and real way is needed more than ever. So I I think sharing your own, what AI can never replicate is sharing your own personal stories. So AI cannot do that. It's your personal stories. The the threat, I think, with a or the trap, I'm going to say it's a trap for people entering storytelling, is they get into ChatGPT and they go, "I would, I need a story around teamwork. Give mm-hmm. me a story," mm-hmm. and it'll pop out a story. And yep. you know what? I, I've been experimenting with this because I've had so many people ask me. They're actually pretty good. They're not bad. The stories that they will pop out are not bad. They're missing something. And I think they're missing the human element, but that will get better. So what I say to people, if you, and Mark, you the question you asked me before, how do, how do you find a story? So if you're going, okay, I've got to give a presentation next week on collaboration and I want to, yes, I've got, I've got all the stats why collaboration works and I've got lots of case studies and work examples, but maybe I should start with a personal story. So I would go, okay, well, first of all, I'd certainly go, well, what does collaboration mean to you? And be clear on that. But let's then, then you, you could, if you cannot think of a a story on your own, if you cannot think of any stories, get into ChatGPT and say, give me 10 stories around collaboration that involve, um, you know, uh, working together for a great outcome. And it will spit out all these, these stories what you want to do then is read them and go, oh, that's just reminding me of something. So that you want to use that to prompt your stories. Mm-hmm. You never, ever want to use those stories. Never use those stories. Just go, oh, actually, I had a similar experience. So like even my story around the copperhead snake, you might be going, God, I really like that story. I wish I grew up on a farm. But you might, but I would go, well, surely you've been on things like you went on a, um, a safari tour and you were given practical safety advice and then you came across something and you knew what happened and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I did, I did. And so you'll have your own example. So that's what you should use AI for as prompters and nothing else. I can imagine that what happens when you get those stories um, from ChatGPT and you fall into the trap of actually using them verbatim you, the skill that you're developing isn't storytelling, but it's acting, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I'd still say it's storytelling. Interesting. I, and when you deliver a story, so I don't, I actually don't do any work on the delivery as such. So the way you deliver it, because what I find is if you're sharing a personal story, it's almost people just because they relive it, 
their actions and their tone, it just becomes all natural. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I've worked with people that have been giving presentations and they're pretty dry, like their delivery style is quite dry. And then they get to the point where they share a story about, you know, their kid or when they were Mm -hmm. a kid or their parents. And it's like this transformation of like, where, where did that person come from? Because they're suddenly all interesting and you know, maybe not animated. I'm not talking about animated hands everywhere, but it might just be they touch their hand on their heart or something like that. And so I think um, when you share personal stories, the the way you deliver it seems more natural. It should be because it's you. It should be. And, and, that's right? why, and that's why it should be true. So what I do say, Mark, if you are making up stories, what you want to be is you want to be a good actor. Like you want to well, be a good actor if you're making point. up stories. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, and- that's uh, that's also an interesting skill, but something else than and something different than we're discussing today. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's next for you on your storytelling journey? Um, I'm I'm constantly loving just doing work with different people. I'm uh, I'm doing a lot more uh, keynote keynote speaking in conferences and. Um, starting to get a bit more US work, so overseas work. So I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, so predominantly my work is in Australia, but I'm doing a lot more overseas work. Um, and I just, I actually just love the fact that storytelling is, you know, I don't get that cynicism anymore. I Like literally today I had three pe- clients, brand new clients ring and say, we want to we wanna run storytelling workshops for our people. And, you know, we're 20 years ago, they would go, oh, we want to run them, but can we call them something different? Can we mm. call them mm-hmm. influence training, communication You've been training? <laughs> yeah, and I'd go, yeah, you can call it whatever you like, but they're going to be storytelling, and it, and it is an accepted. It's like you know, it's twenty years I've been there, and um, I, I tell you what, the the biggest highlight of my career, and it's knowing you're accepted, is when I got a email from the Obama Foundation about five years ago to run training for the Obama mm. Foundation. And that was one of those. First of all, I thought it might have been, a, uh, you know, someone trying to scam me or trick me. Um, and you think, you know, because I think Barack Obama is one of, he's a great storyteller as as is Michelle Obama. Um, but that was one, yeah, I think I've made it. I think I've made it now running storytelling training for the Obama Foundation. This brings me to a point that I should have probably addressed earlier. What's the thing that kept you going for the last 20 years, uh, swimming against the stream? Yeah, it, and it, it probably was swimming against the stream for the first five or six, seven years. There was a lot of, um, when I left uh, my corporate world to do this, I my our two daughters were two and five. So part of me thought, you know, if I, if I, I'll just give this a go and if it doesn't really work, I'm at home with the kids for a few years. So that... That's sort of even the fact that it wasn't really busy, I was home with the kids. So that certainly just was something I was happy to do for the next three, four, five years. And then um, and then it started to pick up and, like, just the opportunities I get. And even though, Mark, I'm sort of delivering the same content, like, I, you know, when I run the training workshops, the same content, it feels different because every the stories are different. I'm hearing new stories and, um, and I just love the fact that, uh, you know, people will go that that's that workshop changed the way I lead, changed the way I communicate for the better. Um, it's been the best professional development I've ever done. Um, and so you hear stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I worked with a client about 10 years ago and she came up with a story and the story was about her dad and she shared it all the time to demonstrate her leadership abilities and I've kept in contact with her and I ran into her just a few months ago in um in Sydney and um she her dad had passed away a few months earlier and she shared that story as part of his eulogy so I mean even even thinking stuff like that and she said it was one of the best things she put the time and effort into developing that story because she's she's used it for her whole career ever since I hope um a lot of Listeners will reach out to you uh, after this episode and and share their st- storytelling uh, experience. Yeah, if they're interested in doing that, like, what are some good ways to follow what you do and the work you do? Yeah, look, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can find me on LinkedIn and connect and follow there. Um, 
you can also go to my website, so gabrieldolan.com, and there, there is like a seven-day storytelling starter kit. So that it's sort of when you subscribe to my newsletter. I, I do try to write a newsletter once a week-ish, um, but you, you, you'll get access to a seven-day storytelling starter kit, we'll just, we, which would get you started on storytelling, as it says. Um, there's a whole – on my website there's so much free resources in there. So if you get into the resource tab, there's a whole heap of um, white papers, um, previous blog posts, there's, you know, my books. There's I've written several books. I would say – it's funny, I would say if you're looking for a place to start, it's my latest book is probably the best one because it's about – it's magnetic called magnetic stories. stories. I'm, yeah, I'm going to re narrate it for the people listening to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's about, and the tagline is connect with customers and engage employees with brand storytelling. So that's actually just a really fun read where I interviewed. So um, that's good. And uh, I, do, I do have a public storytelling workshop coming up on the 28th of November. So I can send the links to that. Um, that's, a, that's a virtual one. Um, and of course, if you run a business and you run a team, then speak to me about an in-house workshop, which is the vast majority of the work I do. Interesting. Awesome. I will definitely add all the links in the show notes to all the relevant material. One final thing I would like to ask you is imagine that we're listening to this conversation during our walk with the dog or doing dishes or cleaning the house. Yep. And we're almost at the end. What's the question that you'd like us to think about, to marinate upon when this episode finishes? Think about how you're currently communicating. And if you're not including personal stories as part of that, you know, whether it's, you know, externally or internally in your organization, you're missing out on the most powerful and effective way to communicate your messages. So if you if you trust me on that one, um, then I would say start exploring it because it will absolutely change the way you communicate for the better forever. So let's do a check-in on how we're currently communicating and seeing if storytelling is part of your repertoire and to which extent stories are part of your repertoire. Yeah. yeah. Gabriel, <clears throat> thanks uh, a lot for... <clears throat> Infusing. I've, I've, I've made you all choke up, have I, Mark? It's you so you have, you have. <laughs> this was, uh, the entire episode was a tearjerker. So <laughs> there you go. Um, once again, thanks for coming on, sharing uh, uh, what you do, uh, inspiring us to bring more stories into our work and uh, getting, um, bringing us back to being more human again. I think that's uh, going to be one of my big takeaways from this episode. So thanks again. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. It's been a pleasure. One thing that really resonated with me was Gabriel's simple framework for crafting a compelling story. It's something that I've already started using myself. She also inspired me to be more intentional about collecting stories, whether it's from my own experience or the experiences of others. I want to make sure that I'm capturing those valuable narratives. Thanks again to Gabriel for sharing her insights and reminding us of the power of stories to connect and inspire. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button and leave a short comment if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, as always, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you have directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine. And I look forward to having you with us again for a brand new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.